Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on how AI is making manufacturing more cognitive today. My name is Jeremy Cowan. I'm editorial director and co-founder of IoT Now, and it's, it's my great pleasure to be your moderator today. Thank you all for joining us wherever you are around the world for a webinar brought to you with l and Technology Services. So the first thing to do is to welcome our speakers. In order of appearance, they are Knud Lasse-Lewis, who is the CEO of IoT Analytics. Welcome, Knud. Thank you. Thank then you, Jeremy. Like to, yeah, good to have you here. I'd like now to introduce you to uh, Mr. Shashida Adongre, who is Head of Digital Solutions, Plant Engineering for l and Technology Services. It's great to have you here, Shashida. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Nice being here. And our third speaker will be Dr. Madhusudan Singh, who is Head of Artificial Intelligence and Cognitive Computing, also from l and Technology Services. Hello, Dr. Madhusudan. Yeah, hello, Jeremy. Hello, and don't forget, everyone, this webinar is being recorded, and tomorrow you can access the audio and slides via our website at iot-now.com. And, of course, at the end of the discussion, you will remember there's always a chance for you to question all our speakers. So you can start sending me your questions right now. I'll put them to our panel at the end. All you have to do is just click on the questions button and type yours into the window. Any that we don't get to can be answered later offline by our speakers. And finally, if you're having any technical issues with audio or slides, you can also use the question window to get advice from our excellent tech support team. Now, as we will hear, manufacturers are reinventing applications with the use of AI algorithms taking complex decisions based on existing data sets. Today's webinar will show that AI is already finding its place in manufacturing, and it follows a slightly different format from previous webinars as we uh, talk through the issues together in a conversational uh, style. But first, I want to go to um, our first poll. This is your chance to give us your views on what is happening in your experience of AI. So which of the following AI techno technologies are on the verge of rapid adoption in a manufacturing environment? Is it machine learning? Is it neural networks? Natural language processing? or visual computing? Which do you think is nearest to rapid adoption in a manufacturing environment? Machine learning, neural networks, natural language processing, or visual computing? I'm going to be intrigued to see um, what the audience's view is of this. Let's go to their uh, opinions. Wow, that's quite comprehensive. Um, 76.7% um, said machine learning, and the next highest was visual computing at 13.3%, uh, with neural networks coming in at 10%, and nobody listing yet natural language processing. Um, we'll probably be talking a lot more about NLP later, but just for a quick view, uh, Knud, is that in line with your expectations? Absolutely. I think we will, uh, in a moment, we will uh, go exactly in deeper into that and specifically go deeper into machine learning. So uh, exactly because manufacturing environments, it's, it's exactly what uh, I am seeing from an analyst point of view as being one of the dominant uh, applications of AI. Shashi, let me ask you next. Um, was this a surprise to you or is this entirely what you expected? I expected this. I'm a little surprised to know zero yet for NLP. I think uh, that does find some, uh, you know, uh, some uses there. So maybe we will discover it as we go further. 
We, we probably will. And Dr. Madhu, um, were you similarly surprised to see zero for NLP? Yeah, definitely. I'm a little surprised for the NLP also. But l let's see, means uh, we can discuss. Yeah, we can. Well, um, now I'd like to ask Nood to tell us why AI in manufacturing is important. Um, Knud, the floor is yours, and I'll advance to the next slide for you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, I'm going to provide you with, a, with the analyst view on uh, AI in manufacturing. And the way uh, we have sort of uh, structured this discussion is that we're going to start with an intro to artificial intelligence. Uh, then we're going to look at what's currently happening in IoT and, and, and what's the digital landscape in manufacturing. And then we bring those two together uh, and look at what's AI in manufacturing. So um, let's start with the first bucket. I think we need to kind of introduce artificial intelligence uh, for this webinar. Um, and the definition of artificial intelligence is it's the ability of a digital computer or computer-controlled robot to perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings. Now, that is um, a very broad definition, but it leads to what, what from, a, from a market point of view, to two different schools of people who, are to, who talk about AI. On the one hand, there are people who say, okay, I, I look at this definition and it basically means AI equals any kind of automation. Um, and those, and then, then there are people that basically say, yes, AI is, for example, um, some if this then that logic, uh, condition-based, very simple condition-based monitoring of bots. And this is very often uh, that you see this right now, that some marketing departments of tech firms kind of relabel existing what previously was called analytics into AI based on that interpretation of the definition of AI. On the other hand, you have um, another school that, that is on the other side that says, well, based on the definition, AI strictly equals self-learning. And we talk about autonomous vehicles, we talk about uh, computer vision automated, NLP, and, and anything that really employs unsupervised machine learning uh, and reinforcement learning, as we will, we will, we will learn in a, in a minute. Um, so for today, we focus on more on the right-hand side. Uh, I would say that um, very often it's not, in, in also in the, in the sense that I use it, it's not strictly self-learning. I think all of the machine learning can be grouped under AI, and that is not, not strictly only self-learning or unsupervised. It can also be supervised. Um, but um, I think it's important when we talk about this to kind of know where we are, uh, and we're right, right now talking on the right-hand side. Um, I also wanted to, at the bottom of this page, quickly um, talk about cognitive. It's another term that is used very often in conjunction with AI. Cognitive itself doesn't really have a widely agreed upon definition. Um, generally, it refers to new hardware and or software that mimics the foundations of a human brain. And when you look at that definition, it's very similar to the definition of AI. So this is sort of to set the scene, what do these terms mean? Now, um, now that we sort of clarified AI, AI actually has, from a, from a technology point of view, a, a variety of techniques. And um, the, a good way to classify it is to say there's supervised machine learning, which is basically um, you, kind of, you kind of have a couple of inputs and you know what you want to get out, um, and then there are various ways of how you can do it. There is a bunch of algorithms uh, how you can do it. The example here is um, if you have time of the year and you have interest rates, you can kind of predict housing prices based on past data and you kind of know what you want to predict. Um, so that's supervised machine learning. Then unsupervised machine learning is um, you you don't really know what you're looking for, um, but you want to find patterns in the data. And so then uh, what happens here is uh, the algorithms cluster different things that are similar uh, and so on and so forth. And again, there's a bunch of different ways of doing it. And then a, a third big category is reinforcement learning, where you, um, where you uh, basically um, have the algorithm, uh, tell the algorithm, 
this is what we want to get out. This is the, like, you are supposed to maximize this outcome. Find the best way to make, so you basically tell it um, that this is, this is the way to do it. Um, and uh, this is kind of used in, in different uh, use cases. A couple are listed here. Uh, it's uh, in portfolio trading. It's an electricity grid. Uh, and we will get to that later. It's also using in, in, in stock and uh, pick inventory using robots. So um, you kind of tell the robot it's good if you if, if you maximize the output, um, and then the then the, the algorithm kind of finds out how what rules do I need to set to maximize the output, for example. There is a third uh, fourth element here that I wanted to explain, which often comes as deep learning. So it's not really one, two, three, or four. One, it's one, two, or three, and then this fourth one, deep learning, is, um, is something that can be applied to any of the above. It's the, the thing about deep learning is it's rather than, um, than having a task-specific algorithm, deep learning is a method um, of, of le uh, le learning data representations. And then we talk about neurons and neural networks. Um, and I think the experts on, as part of this uh, webinar can discuss this much better, but I think it must be clear that deep learning is not another category. It's actually often used in conjunction with reinforcement or unsupervised machine learning. Um, good. And uh, one thing that from, from a market research point of view is really interesting is that AI research or AI um, advances have created very interesting results, generally speaking, in the, in the last years, and, and particularly very recently. And the one example I want to quickly talk about here is Google with their DeepMind project, uh, which created a, a, an, an engine called AlphaGo, which, um, so the, the main takeaway here is that uh, Google has developed a revolutionary AI-based computer engine that easily beats the world champions in both Go and Chess. Um, and the best version of this program had no training data whatsoever and just improves by playing against itself. So it's self-learning. This is basically reinforcement learning at its best. Um, and so when you look at the results, in, in 2017, it beats the number one Go player fairly easily. And, then, and so how, how they achieved this was with a very big training set of supervised machine learning. And then Google actually switched and uh, found a reinforcement learning algorithm that basically said, this is how the game is played. If you win, it's a good thing. Um, and so teach yourself how to, how to win. Uh, and then they basically let that algorithm play against itself and improve and improve and improve. And Google basically says after 40 days, and this is what you can see at the, at the bottom here in the, in the, in the middle, um, this is when uh, it was clearly better than all the, the previous versions. And then they kind of went from Go to Chess, and they um, applied the same thing to Chess. And uh, after just nine hours of teaching itself, the algorithm that Google developed beat the previously best computer engine that had been developed over 10 to 15 years using open source um, and, 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 and easily beat uh, that algorithm. Uh, and from, I personally play chess, so I, I'm kind of very enthusiastic about this. And I have to say, the way this computer plays is beyond anything that the world has seen. And actually, the, the picture here on the right-hand side is bishop g5, which is a totally crazy move uh, you wouldn't think about. But the, the engine just plays out of this world and, and does things a human couldn't imagine. And, I, and the interesting thing is how can you, how can you apply that uh, to manufacturing? And with that, I'll give it back to Jeremy at this point. Thank you, Knud. Well, that's a good overview. And um, what I think our audience would like to know now is really what kind of AI is going to be suitable for manufacturing? Um, it isn't AI based on availability of structured data for learning purposes, and it is the manufacturing sector in general correctly placed for this? Uh, Mr. Shashira, it, it's really over to you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, in this section, uh, we will try to uh, look at uh, the potential use cases in a typical manufacturing plant. Uh, on your screen, uh, you will see a graphic of a typical manufacturing plant with the uh, uh, incoming warehouse uh, shown on the right side. 
and the actual process of manufacture uh, shown in the middle of the picture and the uh, uh, and finished goods right being uh, sent out of the factory uh, to the left hand side uh, you will also find uh, for example utilities like uh, for example diesel generator sets or compressed air being required in the manufacture uh, in the in the periphery uh, uh, and you will also see an erp block right which is necessary for itot integration with the system the question is uh, for long we have been using statistical process control methods in the factories for close to 30 40 years now and data is being used generated to control to refine manufacturing efficiencies and things like that so what does uh, ai bring new into the system when we go to market uh, we have had uh, you know questions from uh, our uh, uh, our uh, our customers uh, saying that you know we want to implement some ai based uh, uh, ai based uh, projects we would like to implement so we always ask the question what is the use case for which you want to implement ai based project because data availability is an extremely important uh, element for any ai based uh, implementation so if you look at this uh, uh, graphic here each one of them each one of those items there uh, including inventory management for example has historical data associated with that and if you have historical data there is a trend associated with that the question is can we use that historical data trends uh, to make better decisions for today and tomorrow right so if you are able to do that then you you have an ai use case on the in the manufacturing place so in today's uh, uh, webinar uh, we will cover uh, out of all of these maybe three areas uh, as case studies uh, later in the program so as highlighted there uh, uh, the vision inspection visual inspection is a major item in many many manufacturing industries uh, for example in the packaged goods uh, you have up to 50 60 uh, to 100 uh, you know types of visual inspections done on the cartons for example and many of them lend themselves to uh, uh, refined uh, visual inspection Uh, and there are uh, uh, in the maintenance field for example the the, the uh, time based maintenance is giving way to condition based maintenance when you talk about condition based maintenance the issue is that what is the condition i am talking about and do we have historical data around that so many plant many areas in the plant lend them, lend themselves to condition based monitoring so we will talk a little bit uh, in one of the future slides Uh, even the itot integration aspect of it right uh, for example uh, uh, i i told you earlier that the nlp did not figure uh, as a as a method and some of the uh, uh, procurement analytics for example could potentially use nlp for their analysis and the improvement of the uh, processes for example right so uh, there are possibilities of ai implementation in all of these areas and for brevity and then for uh, today's uh, webinar Uh, we will be concentrating on three aspects right one is uh, the machine uh, vision based uh, systems uh, second is a procurement analytics and third is uh, regarding the condition based monitoring right as we as we go further uh, so in 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 a nutshell right we see many of these uh, what could not talked about uh, the tenets of uh, the ai technology being used in manufacturing right as i told you there is a huge potential for using vision based systems and uh, the, since lot of data is available machine uh, uh, learning deep uh, learning etc have uh, uh, potential use cases in many of the areas uh, so now i will hand it over to uh, jeremy and uh, uh, further on to the next uh, portion of the webinar jeremy thank you shashi um I, i think it's good now if we spend a bit of time on how to choose the right kind of ai algorithms and solutions to solve the problem statements we've already talked about um i'd like to ask dr madhu to spend a bit of time on the types of algorithms that he recommends dr madhu over to you yeah so uh, as uh, uh, nad has already uh, explained that in in the artificial intelligence when we are talking about the machine learning we are talking about the unsupervised learning we are talking about the supervised learning we are talking about the reinforcement learning we have also talked about the deep learning also uh, there are the lots of the different different algorithms are available so those algorithms are uh, specifically like when we say that unsupervised learning is it's specifically the type of the data which we are uh, 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 the data it means that it they don't have the uh, uh, unlabeled data is there and uh, when we talk about uh, uh, 
uh, uh, supervised learning, there is a loss of the label data is there. Now, uh, uh, the, uh, the current slide which is currently showcasing here is basically that uh, it's showcasing that uh, there, there is a huge potential of the AI in the manufacturing industry. And as far as uh, one of the uh, one of the poll, it is happens that it shows that uh, nearly about 60% of uh, uh, wasted expense we are uh, doing in the manufacturing for doing the unnecessary operations and the maintenance. So what generally it is going to be happen that we service the equipment on the regular basis where it is needed or not. And AI can learn to predict the equipment failures. So uh, with the predictive maintenance, we can anticipate the failures and spend time only on the equipment that needs services. So we waste less on the unnecessary maintenance and your plant stays running longer. So AI uh, start with the predictive maintenance where the based on the past data, uh, machine learning are trained and they can predict the failures which increase the equipment's utilization and reduce the operation cost. Uh, we also see that uh, whereas uh, uh, other areas where the AI can be applicable, they predict the more features like uh, equipment effectiveness, production quality, safety risk. That will help, help to improve the production by decreasing the production cost, improve the efficiency, increase the safety, and reducing the uh, defects. There are the lots of the data is currently available in the manufacturing industry in terms of in the form of uh, sensors data in forms of the image data in forms of the uh, uh, text data. So there are the lots of the hidden insights are there in the records of the equipment's performance. There are lots of the production yields, safety incidents, such type of patterns are available in those type of data sets. If we are going to use AI which can predict those type of uh, equipment effectiveness, production quality, or even safety risk, it will be very great. So, uh, intelligence makes it easier to spot ways to improve the production. It is also find out like uh, nearly about 20 to 30 percent of uh, uh, improvement in the reliability is going to be happen if you are going to use the AI. Hence, in the totality, uh, we are going to increase the reliability and overall value propositions which is contributed by the AI. Uh, if we go uh, move further uh, uh, further ahead, then the AI can also create more value addition by providing the solutions on the optimizations like uh, product optimization, supply chain optimization, and staff allocation optimizations. Uh, moving to the next slide, when we are where we are talking about uh, the machine learning algorithms, here the basically the some of the questions comes that when we are going to use uh, which type of machine learning algorithms. So specifically, if you see that, uh, as mentioned by Nanad and Shashi also, that uh, uh, three types of algorithms, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. Currently in the manufacturing industry, basically uh, the supervised and the unsupervised learning algorithms are mainly used. And in that one also, the supervised learning where the label data is available is highly used. But the thing is that how we can choose that which algorithm is going to be useful for the which type of application. So let us assume if I have a, a data which is a categorical data but having a big data, large set of data is available and I want the speed in my uh, in my computation. So which type of algorithms we are going to use? So if you see in this specific slide where we, we are going to say uh, something is written at the start, if we go with the follow that specific process, you can see that uh, when I say that whether the problem is dimension reduction, so definitely it is not because I have said that it is a labeled data. So it, we, we just come to the uh, next one, we are uh, down where, where it is mentioning that uh, uh, comes to the predictive numeric, yes or no. So as I say that it is the categorical, uh, categorical data, so it definitely it is not a numerical. We move towards the left one, and when, see that, uh, when we have said that we require a speed, so definitely again we move further. And then uh, we come to the uh, data which is too large. In that case, we comes to, uh, uh, comes to the, uh, our finding that the nav based type of uh, model is very useful for the such type of applications. In the same way, uh, you can choose. It is not uh, a, a thumb rule type of thing, but uh, through the research, it is identified that if you go using the such type of chart, it will be very helpful for us to basically identify that which type of model is useful. Uh, I'm just handing over to Jeremy. Thank you. Um, that was very helpful, Dr. Madhu. Um, well, we've got to the point where we're going to have our second poll. 
And the poll question, um, we've already seen one surprising answer in the last poll. Let's see if we get another one this time. Um, what, which are the top AI-led impact areas in a typical factory setup? You can choose one. Which, in your view, is the top AI-led impact area in a typical factory setup? Is it quality inspection, predictive maintenance, procurement efficiencies, or inventory management. So which, in your view, is the top AI-led impact area in a typical factory setup? Let's go forward and see what results we've got. Wow. Uh, a really strong response for predictive maintenance, nearly 72%, followed by quality inspection at just under 19%. And smaller numbers, 6% for inventory management and 3% for uh, procurement efficiencies. Um, let me come reverse order. Dr. Madhu, uh, what was your reaction when you saw these results? Yeah, so I have already mentioned in my uh, – just just I have spoken that nearly about 60 to 65% of people are basically uh, devoting their time in the predictive maintenance. And, and through this poll, I think it is coming very clear that 69%, uh, so I'm uh, pretty good with the, with the poll. Yeah. Um, Shashi, does this uh, – equally, does this match your expectations? Uh, yes, it does. Right? It kind of reflects uh, the, what we are hearing from the industry as well. Thank you. And Knud, anything that you'd want to add? No, I, I, it does for me as well. Uh, I think right now a lot of is, is also happening in quality inspection and predictive maintenance is something that is coming up right now. So I think uh, for the future, I totally agree with it. I think right now quality inspection and predictive maintenance are probably level when I look at and talk to people. Okay. Well, look, um, I've got you on the line now, Knud. Uh, it's over to you for the next comments. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to take the opportunity at this point in the webinar to kind of, we've now gone very deep into AI, and I want to zoom out very quickly, and we want to look at, when you look at manufacturing in general, and, and uh, what is the overall topic landscape and what's happening? And I think one of the key themes we need to uh, be aware of is that in manufacturing specifically, in the last years, we have seen a convergence of IT and OT technology. Uh, you can see this on the chart here. This is coming basically from the 70s to today. And today we have a pretty well accepted five-layer pyramid where the ERP system sits on the top, uh, followed by some kind of manufacturing execution system, uh, in many cases the SCADA system, then we come down to the PLC, Programmable Logical Controller, hardware, and the input-output module. The interesting part is now that we have all of this integrated, um, the future with the industrial Internet of Things probably doesn't look like this anymore. Uh, and that is something that um, a lot of people in the manufacturing world are realizing. And so it's, it's not – so there's a lot of um, uh, questions going on, what does that look like for the future? It is so important that um, countries have basically put this as a matter of strategic importance. Uh, I want to quickly cite the German Industry 4.0 initiative, which, is, which was launched in 2011. Uh, it's since grown, and the, the, things to, the government has basically done a significant investment of about 600 million euros at this point into different initiatives that, that support this sort of future setup. They call it cyber physical systems at some point. Um, everything is under one roof and under the platform industry for zero. And uh, also under that initiative, you have a special attention to uh, small and medium-sized enterprises based on uh, 10 city-based clusters or competence centers, which allow SMEs for some local development for this architecture. Interestingly enough, France, US, China, India have um, come up with their own initiatives uh, as well. Um, which shows how important this is um, to the countries and to also compete uh, on an international level with a very efficient in, in, uh, manufacturing. Now, I'm not going to talk about all of the different things on this, on this chart because we don't have time for that. Um, but when you take that and you look from a manufacturer point of view, you ask yourself, 
what's the digital topic landscape today? What is it we can do or what we want to do? What are the things we need to work on? What's happening? Um, I like to look at it from six different lenses. The first one is the industrial Internet of Things building blocks you see on the left. Uh, and that's really sort of the architecture of the future from the hardware at the bottom to the applications on the top and the system integration on the side of all of that. There's a lot of things happening to um, kind of improve the data that comes from the hardware to the cloud and so on and so forth. I could talk about this for hours, but there's a lot of it happening and, and companies need to realize this, this landscape is, is changing. And that sort of goes along into number two, which we just said, um, some of the existing technologies, uh, such as ERP systems, MES, somehow get disrupted because we might see what you see on the top IoT platforms kind of taking the lead on specific uh, um, uh, uh, to kind of software integration topics. Uh, and so there, that goes together with number one. So number three is there are key use cases coming out, and I'm not going to talk about them right now, uh, because this is, would be key use cases, not only in the context of AI. There are also some use cases which are not really implemented yet, which we call future in, uh, use cases. And then there are also supporting technologies that are not necessarily industrial Internet of Things. Um, but one of those supporting technologies that we list is artificial intelligence. For us, it's one of the important supporting technologies that companies need to look at, but there's others. I mean, some companies are looking at blockchain now, even though that's a fairly new topic, uh, but also certainly 3D printing and other things. And then it's also about which industries are affected. Um, but um, that's a, that's, we got to realize that AI is an important topic, but it's just one of many topics for a manufacturer. Um, I want to do a quick um, check on how is AI now being Use, so I want to deep dive into AI, into this, this basically thing, AI and manufacturing. Uh, and in the sense of time, I need to be ver pretty, fairly quick, so I can't go into every detail here. Um, we asked uh, um, an audience of 130 people last year, uh, um, what role will AI and industrial data analytics play? And, and basically, the outcome was very clear. 15% said today, it's uh, crucial for our business, but 69% said in five years it's going to be crucial for our business. So that really shows everybody has that view and says, yes, it's going to be important. Um, now, when you look at where we want to go and when, we, when you say, you know, we're going to look at the pervasive use of AI and manufacturing, we are really just at the beginning and I quickly want to say why. Um, we do have the uh, relevant AI tools and algorithms in place, even though there's still some um, uh, advances made on deep learning and other things. Uh, we mainly have the data scientists, even though this is one of the, um, you know, we don't have enough and a lot of data scientists are not really trained on specific manufacturing topics yet, so there's a disconnect, but that is fairly good. Um, there is, uh, um, the data sets are there, uh, but they are not always in one platform. We kind of see a lot of companies creating the data lakes right now to have it ready. We've also seen some first value and ROI from AI in manufacturing, but not on a large scale. And so what we're missing right now is really a pool of rolled out case studies that we can learn from. Um, uh, we need the comprehensive sort of semantic models, people call the digital twins, that easily map the whole manufacturing world so you can, an, an algorithm can easily work with that. Uh, we don't necessarily have the edge analytics architecture and perhaps most important to some companies, many employees don't have a mindset to embrace AI and data-driven business models in their organization to uh, really bring that in and, and learn from that. And so my last slide, and then I will hand, hand back over um, to Jeremy. Um, when from a market point of view, um, and a lot of this has already been mentioned, and, and going back to the uh, poll, this is coming up as well, where is AI being implemented today? One of the, um, one of the topics is machine learning at the edge. Uh, and this is, and this is uh, driven by, for example, like an example here would be Siemens as an industrial automation manufacturer. They are kind of connecting their existing PLCs and, and, and trying out, can we push machine learning to the edge instead of a, instead of a fixed logic? Uh, you can see a lot of activity happening in plant process optimization, 
example here would be, uh, in this case, the Deschutes Brewery. They have a case where they kind of dynamically, uh, based on the, the sensor data from the fermentation process, dynamically improve the results. Uh, and this is given, using supervised machine learning, has given them great uh, adv uh, advances. The pattern detection, this goes back to visual inspection, pattern detection and quality control is a huge use case. We just saw that. Foxconn is an example that is, is, is doing this uh, in their uh, assembly lines. And then last but not least, predictive maintenance was also mentioned here today. Uh, what the example here is Tucson Krupp who are connecting the elevators and doing predictive maintenance on the elevator. Um, when we look at the opportunity, we believe right now the market is about 650 US million US dollars when it comes to AI, software, and services in manufacturing. Um, and this is growing quickly. We believe it's going to be about 4 billion in the next five years. Some people say, you know, this is kind of little, but um, I can reassure you, I, last week I talked to two uh, machinery SMEs in Germany, and for them AI is not really on that topic landscape yet, so the potential is still um, huge to tap into these companies. And my last point here would be, uh, you see the use cases on the left-hand side, there are further use cases that will drive the adoption of AI that I haven't talked about. One is autonomous robots. Uh, robots that know, uh, that kind of, kind of see when, when their parts have been moved or, um, there's different, different applications of that. Um, then AI is used in digital product development to improve product development based on existing data. And, uh, last but not least, we'll talk about potential for distributed shop floor intelligence. And with that, I hand back to Jeremy. Thank you, Knud. Um, yeah, we, you've clearly talked about uh, case studies, but we haven't had a chance with you to go into them, which is what we've got now with Shashidara. Can you give us some insight into the various case studies, please? Uh, yes, Jeremy. Thank you so much. Uh, it's interesting that, you know, repeatedly some common themes are emerging, both out of the poll as well as the discussions uh, amongst us, uh, both uh, uh, Dr. Madhusudan, Prud, and uh, Jeremy spoke about it. So uh, we will talk about uh, three uh, broad topics for case studies, but four case studies in all. And these are all have been executed over the last 18 months by LNT Technology Services. Uh, the first one, uh, this customer happens to be a close to $100 billion uh, kind of an organization. So obviously, uh, the amount of, uh, uh, and this is in the in the area of procurement. And you can imagine that uh, being a $100 billion organization, uh, the procurement uh, department is very huge and the amount of data they handle uh, is very huge. One peculiar problem they were facing is that uh, when they issued RFPs to their uh, vendors, they were getting varied kind of uh, structured uh, data uh, in the answers provided by the vendors. So it was difficult for our customers uh, to kind of find commonality and to compare uh, the, the, the responses uh, provided by those uh, vendors. Uh, so uh, they requested us whether we can do a, uh, a semantic search aided by NLP processing, right, so that similar sounding, similar uh, meaning uh, words can be, to, uh, can be uh, brought together and some deeper meanings uh, could be associated for the responses uh, so that you know uh, they, their assessment of their uh, vendors uh, becomes uh, uniform and uh, uh, better right for their assessment so this was implemented uh, uh, by our team here and it's an ongoing process as you can imagine that uh, the the uh, the input data if it is large then the probability of our uh, success rate becomes that much high so initially we passed through this about 6 months of data and we got a result uh, which was uh, close to about 85% of what they desired. And then the, currently the progress which is going on is, is to get further data of uh, around 18 months of data is being fed to this and with a goal of reaching uh, the desired, uh, uh, desired data point. So uh, this uses uh, the, the, the NLP algorithms uh, as well as in some cases uh, the image processing algorithms for converting uh, some uh, some handwritten notes kind of a thing to the uh, OCR kind of a, a, a text as well, right? So this is one example which is uh, used uh, in the procurement area, right, of a manufacturing uh, industry, right? 
uh, I'll go to the uh, next one. Uh, I think predictive analytics has already been uh, uh, corroborated by our viewers today as being the most important, close to 60%. And this is on the subject of condition-based monitoring. And uh, uh, I should also allude to the uh, uh, edge analytics, uh, uh, you know, by by uh, Knut earlier. Uh, this particular solution uh, uh, is meant for rotating machinery and is operational in multiple of our customers today. As you can imagine that any rotating machinery falls in a rotating machinery are a major cause for worry in most of the manufacturing industries. And uh, uh, the measurement of uh, primarily three parameters, one is vibration, another is current, and another is uh, temperature, right, are the three major, major elements for any uh, correlation with the faults. Now, vibration is something where uh, you need to do a lot of uh, uh, FFT based analysis uh, and since the sampling percentages are higher the possibility of taking the data to the cloud for uh, further processing is a little difficult. So hence what we have done is to take a uh, two-step approach that we have a gateway right which is uh, mounted very close to the uh, motors and then there uh, the sensors are connected to the gateway and the gateway in turn is connected to the cloud. So, uh, so what we do is uh, some amount of uh, uh, near real-time algorithms are implemented in the gateway, but the longer-term analysis is done in the cloud and all the signatures are returned back down to the uh, edge gateway here. So net-net what we get is a, a good combination of edge gateway processing plus the long-term analysis which is done in the cloud. And with this, we are able to predict the fault uh, uh, of the rotating machinery uh, reasonably well right in the in the in the in our uh, target industries so uh, as you can see the the sensors uh, are connected to the rotating machinery either by uh, the the uh, by a nut or by a uh, adhesive adhesive which is used and these are typically high uh, sensitivity with higher sampling rate uh, kind of sensors and uh, the correlation between for example uh, the current rising and temperature rising, right, is something which is done and the signatures are uh, written there. Uh, one of the tenets of uh, rotating machinery is that when you first install, uh, the rule of thumb is that when you first install the motor, uh, you run this algorithm and take, take a signature and then over a period of time see how the signature uh, changes, right. Uh, so hence, it's very important that we run this for uh, for longer time and also do the uh, offline correlation with the faults which have uh, which have occurred historically and to uh, to get a, a fine balance right between the uh, predictivity and the uh, data processing which is to be done. Of course, uh, as in all uh, implementations, uh, we have also implemented uh, a user friendly uh, uh, app right which can be seen uh, on the mobile. So you can see two views here. One is the asset level view, where it can give you a specific asset, uh, what is happening. And in this case, you can see three assets there. It can also give you a line view, right? Uh, many a times, a series of uh, rotating machinery form a line. And it's important not only to look at one asset, but also a, a series of uh, that assets together. Hence, it gives you a realistic value, whether the whole line is operational or not. So uh, this has been implemented. This is a classic case of uh, a, a, a machine learning algorithms being implemented in a embedded environment plus the uh, another set of machine learning algorithms implemented in the cloud so it it uh, do, does a combination of uh, uh, combination of both of these uh, moving on right uh, uh, i think the second uh, uh, shall we say second best today in the poll was about quality inspection i think uh, i must say that you know quality inspection is attracting a lot of attention around the world, notwithstanding uh, the, the issues of uh, employment, etc. Uh, there are two issues here in terms of uh, why somebody wants to uh, automate. Uh, one, of, one major thing is to reduce human errors, right? Any amount of visual inspection uh, finally could lead to human errors and the uh, errors which are left to the field are always costly to repair. The other aspect, collateral aspect, I would say is to reduce uh, uh, manpower. Uh, uh, and uh, in, uh, uh, in 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 uh, some some uh, industries, uh, to getting uh, getting the uh, manpower which is proficient enough to do the proper visual inspection has also been difficult. So hence uh, hence the uh, idea of uh, can I can we do uh, automated uh, visual inspection? 
uh, our experience shows that you know, if you have 100 visual inspection items to be done, uh, it is not possible to have all the 100 to be automated. People generally uh, generally do about 70 to 80 percent, and the remaining 20 percent, uh, you know, is a continuous improvement over the base. So here I will present. Uh, I would like to present two. Uh, I would like to present two use cases. Uh, the first one uh, is a defect inspection implemented in a semiconductor uh, manufacturing industry. Uh, in a semiconductor manufacturing industry, the, uh, they use a special uh, wafer plastic tray uh, to carry the wafer from one location to the other. And any dents, any deformation caused uh, uh, for the plastic tray uh, finally ends up in a defect of the uh, component which comes out of the uh, foundry. So hence, it was extremely, extremely important to visu vis vis visually inspect these trays for any uh, notion of uh, defects and before they were put onto the manufacturing. Uh, so what we implemented uh, was this uh, multiple camera-based, uh, high-resolution camera-based system with special lighting and uh, mirrors uh, uh, being implemented in the line, which could detect even the minutest defects in the, uh, uh, these plastic uh, enclosures which carried the wafers. And uh, of course, this, this resulting, how do you know that this is working? Because they had passed uh, data about uh, the failure, uh, failures of uh, these plastic enclosures. The output, was, uh, output of uh, AI algorithms was compared with that, and a pass-fail pass criteria was implemented, which uh, would be improved over a period of time by constant learning of the, uh, uh, the data which, which was uh, getting accumulated. So, uh, uh, so again, it's important in a visual inspection environment. As important as the uh, algorithms is also the position of the mirrors, position of the uh, uh, the camera, and lighting. Uh, these play a very, very important role in the uh, vision inspection uh, uh, aspect. The second one is interesting, right? Uh, this was, uh, uh, you know, you will find a lot of products being sealed, heat sealed, uh, to protect the contents uh, within that. And then the challenge in the industry. Uh, is to uh, is to find out leaks right out of these uh, heat sealing element. Uh, in this uh, example, we uh, uh, we implemented two kinds of uh, visual uh, elements. One was a thermal camera. The other one is a uh, normal uh, visible range uh, camera. Uh, as you can see that uh, the the when you heat seal the porch, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, cor uh, corrugations are not very uniform, and that lends itself to a variation of visual inspection. And that was done by the visible uh, aspect of the camera. The thermal uh, right, uh, camera would indicate uh, any uh, hot liquid when it was getting packed. Uh, is there any uh, fumes coming out of that? And then that would be captured by the thermal camera. And of course, uh, the, the, uh, the thresholds for this, these pass-fail kind of uh, thresholds are not uh, easy to uh, set here. Uh, because you don't want good products to be rejected. So hence, it took a fairly long time uh, for the uh, algorithms to get stabilized. And of course, this was a supervised learning because we had lots of uh, past data right, to be able to uh, learn the algorithm. So these are uh, two uh, examples uh, 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 for, for, the, uh, for the visual inspection right, uh, kind of a criteria. So uh, all in all, right, uh, if, you, if you just to summarize, right, we have seen uh, three different kinds of, uh, you know, implementations, AI-based implementations. One was in the procurement uh, area uh, to compare large amounts of data uh, to read meanings into the uh, responses uh, from the vendors. Uh, the second one was on the uh, condition-based monitoring for rotating equipment, uh, implementing both edge-based as well as cloud-based uh, AI algorithms. The third one, two of them, uh, for implementing vision-based inspection in a manufacturing environment. Uh, uh, so I suppose, uh, I hope that this provides a little uh, deep insight into the potential use cases. Of course, these are only a few of the uh, many use cases which are possible in a manufacturing industry. Uh, with that, I hand over to uh, Jeremy. Thank you, Shashi. Um, okay, let me quickly try to summarize some of the key takeaways from today. Um, we just got time before we go to your questions. And we have had a lot of questions in, but please keep them coming. Um, I've only got a couple of minutes, so this is necessarily a, a high-level view. But clearly, there can be many impact areas for, IA, for AI in a factory. 
and that's ranging from the incoming warehouse through uh, operations, technology and security, um, quality inspection and predictive maintenance to supplying the finished goods. So there are loads of impact areas and AI will call on historical data. Uh, the second thing that I, I took from this was that the applications of AI can be broken down into three key areas. Um, and I'm thinking here about machine vision-based quality control and predictive analytics. I'm thinking of procurement analytics and condition-based monitoring. Um, Shashi also said that uh, AI has produced a number of cognitive technologies, but he focused on, on the core tenets being computer vision, machine learning, and natural language processing, or NLP for short. And Dr. Madhu showed us that um, applied, and I emphasize applied, industrialized AI in manufacturing, um, it monitors and predicts failure, it, it improves production quality, it increases efficiency in design and production, um, it removes waste and it automates operations. Um, there's clearly more that we could say. Knud showed us that AI is just one piece of the manufacturing puzzle, but we're only partially reaching the availability of experienced data scientists. We're only partially reaching the availability of data sets in one platform, and we're only partially reaching or seeing proven return on investment for manufacturing use cases. I mean, that doesn't get away from seeing some very interesting use cases from Shashi just now. Finally, I'd say there is more, but um, I, I, I've only got time to add that we are clearly at an inflection point for AI in manufacturing, where information technology or IT and industrial automation or operations technology, OT, are converging, and they're converging for the industrial Internet of Things. That's my takeaways. Um, others will have others, I'm sure. Um, but what I'd like to do now is go to the questions that we have from the audience and to understand a little bit about what you're thinking. Um, so let's find out what has been asked. Uh, we have a question from India, um, somebody asking, predicting equipment effectiveness. Are we talking about having sensors on equipment which provide data? Um, Shashi, would you mind helping us here, please? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes, this question, uh, uh, you know, we need sensors on the equipment. Uh, uh, that's a primary source of data coming out. Uh, it is also possible that you know the uh, we we look at the uh, output of the equipment and then uh, decide uh, you know the health of the equipment. But it's always uh, important or uh, preferable that to have the basic sensors mounted on the equipment to measure the uh, uh, to measure the. Uh, uh, to, to kind of measure the predictive uh, aspect of the equipment. Um, Dr. Madhu, would you add anything to that? Uh, yeah, so uh, as, as Sashi has mentioned that uh, uh, predictive equipment's uh, effectiveness is basically uh, you have to first you have to mount the sensors over the over the machines and then you have to get the data and you have to run the different different types of machine learning models over that one to basically uh, see that the, what how the machine is uh, effectively working. So I think that uh, by using the uh, by using the different machine learning algorithms, you can definitely make a better sense of the data. Thank it you. also um, depends on. Go ahead. Yeah, it is also depends on the uh, uh, amount of money you are ready to spend. Uh, you know, for example, in a uh, equipment, uh, there may be oil. For example, right? Oil uh, uh, contamination could be a trouble, but it's not very easy to measure oil contamination. For example, right? So you will uh, uh, go with indirect methods to measure oil contamination if there are no direct methods which are possible. 
but generally speaking, as a thumb rule, direct measurements of uh, causes of uh, uh, of faults is always preferred. Okay, Shashi, while I've got you, I think this is a question that I should perhaps put to you first. Um, somebody has asked um, on condition-based monitoring, how many devices can be connected per gateway? Uh, it depends on the implementation. Uh, our gateway, for example, can be connected to uh, nine sensors at the same time. Uh, so uh, these, uh, for example, if you take three sensors per uh, rotating equipment, it means three uh, machines uh, per gateway. But it uh, entirely depends on the gateway uh, design. Thank you. Um, Dr. Madhu, uh, somebody has asked a very sensible but very um, simple question here. Will mechanical engineers benefit by knowing machine learning? I suspect I know your answer, but I'd like to hear your, your view. Yeah, so machine learning is uh, something which is uh, anybody can learn, anybody can use it, and uh, uh, definitely a, a mechanical guy also can learn and those things. Uh, only the thing is that, uh, only my suggestion is that it, the, the person should be mathematically strong and should have a good knowledge over the logic. So uh, it's, it's more like uh, a good mat uh, mathematicians with the greater uh, logic, uh, logical capability can become a machine learning scientist. Yeah. Um, this is a really topical question. Um, somebody's asked, what are the security challenges associated with fully functional AI-enabled e factory setups? Um, Dr. Madhu, can I continue with you first, please? Uh, the, uh, there, there, are the, there are lots of the security challenges may come, uh, but it depends, like uh, if, you are, uh, if you are using on-premises or over the cloud, so generally the people are having uh, more issues to sharing the data over the cloud, but uh, right now the technology is so much advanced and the lots of the security protocols are available, I think that uh, uh, we can go ahead with the, without any hesitance. And Shashi, do you want to say anything on the subject of the security challenges for AI? Yeah. Uh, in security, there are two main tenets which you will have to handle. One is called data at rest, and another is data in communication. Uh, for example, when you have the gateway there collecting data uh, from the systems, is that gateway itself is secure enough, right? And the data which is stored in the gateway, uh, can anybody uh, steal it, for example, right? So those are things which you will have to address. And of course, on the communication media, for example, sensor to gateway, gateway to the cloud, uh, all these technologies are available. It's mostly implementation, uh, which uh, generally we lack. And along with the implementation, we need continuous monitoring and auditing of this uh, whole link. I think if you take care of these fundamental uh, premise, uh, you are generally secure. Of course, there are industry standards, uh, like, for example, there are NTSC standards, uh, there are 62443 standards, which you can always refer to and implement as per those standards, right, for your benefit. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we are running really short of time, and I want to uh, get one more question in. Um, somebody has asked, uh, it, artificial intelligence will help in predicting the failures that can happen in the future, but how long will it take to find out an error in the algorithm being used, if any? Um, Shashi, could you cover that first, please? Yes. Uh, uh, it, it all depends on how much data you have. Right? The more uh, amount of data you have, the better your prediction is. Uh, so what we have seen, seen typically is that a, a, a data which is around six to nine months of data, historical data being available, uh, gives a very, very good performance on your uh, predictability if your implementation of algorithms is uh, generally right. Uh, but to expect uh, miracles to happen in by 15 days data, 30 days data, I would say a little foolhardy, right, uh, using AI, right? I would say have a little patience, have uh, six to nine months of data, and uh, using all these technologies, you are sure to get uh, good results. Thank you. And last question to you, if I may, Dr. Madhu. Um, an international cooperative company has asked, are deep learning algorithms being used already in the manufacturing sector? If you could keep your answer 30 seconds, I'd be very grateful. 
Yeah, so right now in the manufacturing, uh, uh, specifically the deep learning is specifically used in the computer vision area where the quality inspection, those type of things are uh, being used. So uh, generally the deep learning uh, type of uh, uh, technology is used where the huge set of uh, data is available, whether it is a sensors data, whether it is image or video data or whether it is a text data. Uh, uh, in general, it is fi find out like in the much, uh, in the manufacturing industry, uh, the huge amount of the sensors data is available. Plus, besides that, the huge amount of uh, image or video data is available. So generally, like uh, models like uh, convolution neural networks are being used for solving the problems of related with the uh, with the computer vision. Whereas the uh, whereas the models like uh, recursive neural network or the LSTM type of models are basically used for uh, 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 predict, uh, for the predictive maintenance or uh, doing the uh, root cause analysis type of things. So definitely the, uh, if, if the good amount of uh, data is available, deep learning model is currently used. Thank you. Thank you, uh, in fact, to all of our speakers. Um, as I said earlier, the aim of the webinar has been to try and help you uh, understand AI in manufacturing and not at some point distant in the future, but now. And we talked through many of the challenges, and we talked about how to overcome them. Sadly, that is all we have time for. Um, please don't forget to bookmark our website at iot-now.com. You will find the latest news there, and you'll also find videos, blogs, events, and interviews. And from tomorrow, you can stream this webinar from the site. It just remains for me to say a very big thank you to our speakers who, in order of appearance, were Knud Lassie-Lewis, CEO of IoT Analytics. Thank you very much, Knud. Thank you, Jeremy. It was a pleasure. And Shashida Adongre of l and Technology Services. It's been really great to have you here, Shashi. Thank you, Jeremy. It was a pleasure. And finally, Dr. Madhusudan Singh, also from l and Many thanks, Dr. Madhu. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. It's, it's a pleasure talking to everyone. It's been great, and thank you. Most of all, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you. Thank you for joining us from around the world. Please keep safe, and we really appreciate the time that you have spent with us. From everyone here at IoT Now, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now.